Um, Lisa is a photographer. She's an attorney. She currently works as a peer specialist. She describes herself as a humanitarian, and actually I want to tell a story that you didn't tell me, which is that um, the, the Ponset River Clubhouse, actually each year around Memorial Day, um, goes to where the grave sites are in Medfield for people who have been buried in that area, um, who were patients at the time of their death. And there are over 800 people who were buried um, there. And up until more recently, those grave sites were identified by numbers. Um, and I think a lot of work and advocacy went into identifying each and every one of those 804 people. 804, right? Um, 841, sorry. Um, so that they would have uh, dignified burial spaces. And each year, the club goes back and puts flowers on each of those graves. And um, you, are, you are part of that group that does that, which is just so impressive. But now we understand the humanity of being part of it. So. And it's an extremely moving experience to see that some people were dying at uh, Medfield State Hospital in 19. 87 so uh, but you know many people that I know myself actually have very very fond memories of living there but anyway we'll get to what I have to say I'm Lisa Newell I'm in I'm bipolar and I'm in recovery from abusing alcohol and drugs I grew up in Miami Florida born of parents from Massachusetts and I have to say the mood swings started young I went into a major depressive episode around the age of 12. From there, periods of risky behaviors and endless amounts of time in bed followed me through my 20s and 30s. During all those years, I went to therapists and psychiatrists, but there was never a diagnosis or any medication. I did, however, manage to accomplish things, such as an undergraduate degree in fine art from the University of Florida and a cum laude degree from law school here in Massachusetts, where I moved and never left. I started a number of different career paths following each degree, and finally ended up working for DMH as an attorney. When I was younger, I had a serious substance abuse problem, but managed to get sober at the age of 30, and remained so for the next 18 years. But in sobriety, the mood swings remained, and then I started working for DMH, and they were getting worse. Previous to that, I was... No. Sorry about that. Wasn't meant that way, guys. <laughs> Previous to then, I was diagnosed as depressed and put on medication. Later on, while I had begun working there, a medical doctor prescribed a dangerous combination of drugs that took me into a psychotic break. I, got, I uh, began hearing command voices from God and became aggressive and angry. At DMH, my relatively new supervisor came into my office one day and asked me about a witness for an upcoming hearing. I started screaming at him. I was mortified at the words that were coming out of my mouth, but I could not stop myself. He just stood there while I did all this with his mouth open and walked out, probably lucky just to escape. Afterward, I called my psychiatrist and said I needed to go to a hospital. Once there, I was immediately diagnosed as bipolar, which looking back fit the extremes in my mood swings throughout life. Fast forward to 12 years later, I'm now retired and a lot of changes have taken place. The biggest and worst thing I had done was started to drink again. For the next 10 years, I would be hospitalized over 25 times. It was the worst decision I had ever made. I was a mess. Everyone I encountered tried to help. I wanted to quit, but after 30 to 60 days, I would throw in the towel and begin the horror show anew. My depressive episodes were frequent and I went to new lows. I took my meds piecemeal, and of course they don't work well that way. The police knew me, the ambulance drivers knew me, the doctors and nurses knew me, the programs knew me, and around and around we go. Somehow, I got DMH services and was connected to Riverside. 
I had my first set of workers through CBFS. My rehab advocate was Kara. I also had an employment specialist named Mike and a sobriety advocate named Jen. I do believe God sent them all into my life. I was still drinking, but tried to be semi-sober during appointments at my apartment. I continued to go to hospitals and programs while they stuck with me. It got to a point also that my family had had enough. They couldn't do this with me anymore, and I never felt so alone. Then one day I was discharged from a program after being accused of doing something I did not do. I was sitting in the back of the cab with nowhere to go. Somehow, right then, I'd had enough. I made a call to a place I'd been before, the Riverside Respite Program in Norwood. I spoke with Emily, who was the director, and asked her if she had a bed. She said yes, and that was the day my life changed. The cab took me to respite, and I lived there for almost two months. I was scared, but finally committed to sobriety. I had nowhere to go, and I was homeless for the first time in my life. Emily worked hard at getting me into a Riverside dual diagnosis house called Milton Street. I ended up living there for the next year and a half. I was taking medication regularly and adjusting to sober life. Well, at Milton Street, I became a proud member of the Nepontic River House, and it turned my life around. This is a clubhouse for people like me. I got very active, volunteering to do anything and everything I could. I got my confidence back, and I became a person I liked again. And while at NRH, I became a certified peer specialist and started looking for a job again. I continued to work with Mike for employment. After living at Milton Street for a year and a half, I was told Riverside would subsidize an apartment for me. I found a great place in Walpole where I still live with my dog, Izzy. In the meantime, my family came back into my life as well. And I finally got that peer specialist job. I now work at the respite in Norwood where my story began. I no longer need CBFS, now ACCS, but I do work with DMH, and my case manager there is Kara, who is my very first RA. And the site manager of that office is no more, no other than Emily, who let me come into that respite. It's a small and wonderful world. Ultimately, just as all these steps were necessary to recover, the people who did and are still helping me are absolutely vital for guidance along the way. You heard in my story how there were many different programs I took advantage of. Some hold you tightly while you're still wavering and some are like a parent taking training wheels off a bicycle. People being served and riding that bike might wobble a bit and then take off, or they might wobble and fail and need a hand up. Either way, there is someone from a service standing by ready to fulfill the need for those like me. We have a lifelong illness that stands ready to creep back in when ignored, taking over and causing chaos in a life running smoothly. Although I'm working part-time, I still jealously guard my membership at NRH as it's where I can always go and see my family of choice. Thank you to all of you who are taking the time to listen, and especially to those who are here today that fund the programs and services that keep me out of the hospital and on the right track. Thank you. <laughs>